So Seung Ki um, is, is an agriculture economist in the department working, as you can see from his slide title, his main area is to focus on things relating to commodity markets. Uh, Seung Ki um, is originally from Korea uh, and he got his uh, PhD in agricultural economics and economics at Iowa State University. So Seung Ki, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over the microphone to you and um, welcome to our, your first Policy and Outlook Conference. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my presentation. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the commodity markets outlook uh, with an emphasis on corn and soybean uh, today. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. So, so um, here is the outline uh, for my presentation. First, I'm gonna talk about corn and soybean commodity markets. Specifically, several market aspects will be discussed, uh, price, supply, demand, uh, fertilizer price issue, and uh, global view. Afterward, I will briefly talk about the livestock market as well. Uh, for your information, uh, there are a few appendix slides that will not be covered in my presentation, but people can refer to them. Um, Appendix A has a couple of comprehensive summaries of price, production, and export for, for various commodities, the commodities that, uh, that, that are not covered in my presentation. Appendix B shows a brief overview of wheat. Uh, let me start with uh, price trends. Uh, the right figure with a uh, dual y-axis uh, shows the corn and soybean cash prices in the Cincinnati area. The red line indicates uh, corn price index by the left y-axis, and the black line indicates soybean price scaled by uh, the right, uh, right y-axis. Uh, several interesting points are observed here. Uh, first, strong prices. Corn and soybean prices are about uh, 5.6 uh, and 12.2 dollars per bushel, respectively, which are about a dollar higher level than a year ago. Second, positive profitability. Um, the observed cash prices are well above the uh, cost estimates here and here. Um, so the cost estimates are about, uh, it, the cost estimates are, are, are borrowed from the farm office of OSU extension, uh, which are about $4 per bushel for corn and $9 per bushel for soybean. Uh, so per bushel, corn and soybean are respectively expected to return $1.6 and $3.2 as a net profit. Uh, third, uh, I wanna emphasize the seasonality and volatility. So the left graph here uh, is showing the 40 year monthly price move implying the seasonality of prices for both corn and soybean. Of course, last year was exceptionally offset seasonal price pattern because of the pandemic. Uh, but this year, the price tends to, the price trends look converging back to the seasonality, which can improve our predictability. However, at the same time, the large volatility makes precise prediction very difficult. Uh, in fact, when I drew the same graph as the left one using the this year's data, the extent of fluctuation was much bigger, about more than two times uh, with the same y-axis scale. So given the market uh, prices, maybe it is, a natural, it is natural to ask, what would be the crop prices in the, in the near future? Uh, what would, be, uh, what, what, uh, would it be as much supporting as it is now? Or like, this should be an important question to many people. So um, for the future price, maybe I would refer to the futures price as a benchmark, um, the future market, I mean. So the 21-22 season average futures, futures price for corn is uh, $5.85 per bushel. And for soybean is $12.55 per bushel. Uh, they are obviously positive forward forecast of prices, although they have to keep an, we have to keep an eye on them as things are moving forward. Uh, because of course this will reflect the market situation and quickly moves uh, as time goes on. And third uh, price related index I wanna show is the basis. 
um, one of the most important, of course, price related information. Um, the basis is defined by the difference between cash price and futures price. Um, and here are the basis map uh, with Ohio border is dotted by uh, denoted by a dotted line. As the basis re reflects the regional value of commodities, it is important to focus on, on Ohio. Uh, reddish counties mean they have a weaker basis and green to bluish counties stand for the region with a strengthening basis. Um, as shown in the map, uh, most counties in Ohio have weak basis relative to other Midwest regions, uh, which are lower than uh, minus 30 cents. Uh, for example, in the case of Dark County, the December uh, historical basis is about minus 9.2 cents uh, for the last three years, but this year is minus 30 cents and soybean basis looks stronger. Uh, over, overall, Ohio and Indiana region uh, shows a strong pay, uh, show, show a strong basis uh, for comparison to corn. If we back to the Dark County example, the historical soybean basis uh, is minus 41 cents, while the current basis is about uh, thir minus 34 cents. So um, this is kind of somewhat relevant information. Of course, uh, this will be also changing uh, by the region and by the time. So very, very time sensitive, but when it comes to the point of uh, trade or point of make this decision making, farmers need to uh, take a look at this uh, type of information, of course. Um, so far, we have seen some price indices, uh, which are consequences of supply and demand. And to get a better understanding of the driving forces of the current and future prices now, uh, let's take a look at the supply and demand. Um, first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the supply side. Um, um, here is the national corn production. Uh, the, the left graph here is uh, showing the historical yield pattern. Uh, this, yield pe uh, this year's yield estimate is 177 uh, bushels per acre, a record high and uh, slightly above the, above the trade uh, trend line, as you can see here, and based on the percentage, it is about 0.3%. Uh, uh, the total production is projected to be over 15 billion bushels, which is the largest production amount on record as well. So certainly we are expecting a massive uh, corn crop supply. Um, here is the state level corn production. Ohio production is estimated to be especially high, uh, 188 bushels per acre, a record high uh, as well um, within the Ohio history. And this is about 9% above the time trend of historical o Ohio corn yield as shown in the right figure. Um, last week, Ohio farmers made good harvest progress uh, based on the USDA report, so the weekly report. Uh, corn harvest progress in Ohio is about 78% uh, this week, 13% up from last week. The progress is slightly ahead of last week's, uh, last year's speed and similar to the five-year average pace. Now, soybean production. Uh, nationwide, soybean harvest has been completed about 87% so far. This year, U.S. Uh, soybean yield is estimated to be 51.2 bushels per acre, and the uh, the second this is the second highest yield record after 2016. Uh, it is about four percent uh, higher than the time trend. Uh, to, the total uh, soybean production estimate is about 4.4 4 .4 billion bushels. Uh, so similar to corn, uh, the bumper soybean crop is expected to come to market this year. And um, going into the state level uh, soybean yield, around 88% of Ohio soybean land is harvested now and about 7%, this is about 7% up from last week. However, the progress is lagged uh, both last year and the five year average. So we are a little bit like slower than uh, where we used to be. Uh, Ohio soybean yield is uh, 
56 bushels per acre, again, the record high of a state like corn, and it is about 11% above the Ohio soybean yield trend. Um, to sum up, an ample amount of uh, crop supply is expected this marketing year, and um, now we have to maybe think about then what would be the uh, mixture of this supply and interplay of supply and demand. So uh, here is some like a uh, summary table of uh, corn supply and use. So uh, this is uh, from the last week's USDA report and uh, provides a good overview. Uh, for your information, 21, 22 market column is mostly composed of forecast. So probably there is, we, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, uh, of course, uh, some numbers about the supply should be what you have already seen in, in my previous slides, um, like the, the, the yield level or something like that. Uh, on the supply side, we have started from a low beginning stock in 21-22 uh, marketing year, actually the lowest level over the last five years, um, mainly because of, um, uh, because of the large increase in uh, export volume to China last year. Uh, we are expecting 3% increase uh, both in planted area and yield uh, compared to last year, which is the main reason uh, for, the, uh, for the large production. Uh, as a result, we have a good amount of expected total supply this year. And uh, when looking at the demand side, the corn export uh, is expected to go down by 9% from last year. Uh, this reduction is likely to be offset by increase in corn use for feed and uh, ethanol. Uh, I will walk you through the, uh, the, the three demand categories a little more in the following slides. Uh, total corn use is predicted to be almost the same level as last year, implying a strong corn demand prospect. The ending stock uh, will be, uh, will be, uh, will be, will get bigger, but still quite lower than where it was before 2020. Uh, lastly, the season average price is predicted to be $5.45 per bushel, 20% uh, higher than last year. And in fact, the highest level since 2013. Uh, now let's check what kinds of demands, demand factors are supporting this positive price forecast and which variables should we pay attention to. So um, the first demand uh, category, um, corn feed and residual use. Uh, this is actually taking the largest portion of demand, uh, corn demand, which is about 38% last year. Um, also, it is known to be relatively tricky to get a precise prediction compared to other demand categories since, uh, since the most relevant USDA data is released every quarter. Uh, the first uh, quarter record has not been announced yet. Um, alternatively, we can calculate the target feed use using the historical data. Uh, uh, so as, as shown in the left figure, about 43% uh, about uh, of total corn feed and residual is purchased in the first quarter during the last five years. So uh, by combining this number and the given estimate of total corn feed, uh, about 5.6 billion bushels, uh, I would propose uh, 2.45 billion bushels as a reasonable benchmark uh, in order to test if the USDA uh, projection for corn feed and residual use will likely to be achieved. Uh, maybe next month we can, we can get to the moment of truth. And next, uh, ethanol consumption. The, second largest corn demand. Um, it is expected to increase 4% uh, from last year, which would be the biggest positive demand shifter. A large amount of corn demand for ethanol is ex explained by high gasoline and lean, uh, lean prices. Uh, lean means uh, renewable identification number, uh, which incentivize uh, fewer producers to use more corn for ethanol. Uh, the current wind price as shown in the left graph uh, is the highest level uh, in the history of actually the renewable fuel standard. Uh, 
high wind price typically results from two factors. Uh, one is a high cost of biofuel production and two is a large amount of renewable volume obligation, RVO. Um, and based on the recent EI, EIA report, the current high rent uh, price is mainly attributed to the high cost of biofuel production. Um, given the circumstances, we may wonder which changes may affect uh, corn demand and eventually corn price. Uh, I have picked uh, two noteworthy variables that can potentially affect corn demand from ethanol production. Um, first, uh, next year's uh, renewable volume obligation amount, which is not confirmed yet. Uh, if it is reduced, clearly that would be a pressure to decrease corn demand um, from ethanol use. So negative factor for uh, corn, corn price, price potentially. Uh, second, a possible adjustment in gasoline price. Um, EIA forecasts the gas price will be down to $2.91 per gallon next year. Uh, although the gas price the gas price drop would help many components of the supply chain. Uh, it can bring about a less biofuel production, which will eventually decrease the corn price. Uh, so those two were uh, the factors uh, that I would uh, that I want to highlight uh, in the ethanol part. And third, uh, the last corn demand uh, group I want to discuss is export. Um, note that in in my presentation I am I am focusing only on quantities of trade rather than the monetary value uh, because I am illuminating trade, vol tr trade volumes as a demand shifter. So some trade, some trends here uh, may have different shapes or uh, directions from what you have seen from Dr. Ian Sheldon's slides yesterday. Um, the left figure shows the, the cumulative export volume defined by the amount of shipped or uh, committed corn this year, uh, corn export volume looks pretty good, showing a similar trajectory to last year's record. Uh, the current USDA projection for the total export volume is about 9% below the last year's record, uh, as you can see here at this point. Um, and uh, next, the right graph uh, needs a bit of explanation. Um, the graph is generated based on this year's uh, current export record. Uh, and uh, this is um, dual y axis graph. Uh, the bar chart shows the export shift uh, indexed by the left y axis. Uh, and the denoted numbers, like this percentage, means the percentage change from last year's November. So this is uh, kind of showing the changes of uh, based on the November observation of trade volume how much it was shifted from uh, a year ago observation. So that is the point. And blue dots uh, represent export volume uh, and are indexed by the uh, right y axis. So for these blue dots should be actually uh, checked with this uh, white axis. So the total uh, export volume in November, like till the November is about like uh, thousand, uh, uh, about like uh, 1.2 uh, billion bushels. So, so that's that's how how that's the way to read this graph. Um, the the six countries uh, are the top six U.S. corn importers um, in in the x uh, rate in the x axis. The the rank goes by one to six uh, from left to right, uh, as we can see from the blue dots actually. Uh, so. Uh, starting from the China, Mexico, Japan, Colombia, Canada, Guatemala, and then others. Um, and the seventh bar actually here, the, the unknown, uh, is capturing export sales that uh, are currently marketed for unknown destinations. For example, a multinational company may purchase corn to be shipped in three months, but they are not sure where uh, they, want to, where they want the corn delivered to Shanghai, China, or Seoul, South Korea, or Taipei, Taiwan. In those cases, the sale is marked as unknown. So um, that is like why this unknown is uh, uh, defined. And 
now let's let's read the graph. Um, China, Mexico, Canada have been the major drivers of export increase, whereas Japan and unknown were uh, the main reasons for the export reduction. Uh, particularly, the negative shift in the, the unknown can be understood as a consequence of continuing shipping challenges. So over corn demand from export looks not bad, but the shipping issues would be the critical variable during this market year. Um, now here is an overview table for soybeans. Uh, again, um, 21, 22 values are USDA forecast. Uh, as shown earlier, soybean production has a similar story to corn. So total supply is expected to decrease by 1% simply because of the low beginning stock. Uh, total demand is projected to decrease by 3%, mainly due to the export shifts. Uh, as a result, the ending stocks are forecasted to rise by 33%. Uh, however, still the soybean price is forecast, forecasted to be fairly high at uh, $12.1 per bushel. Uh, since the trade volume looks like the most significant factor, uh, let me go through the soybean export. So um, there are, uh, um, these are having the, the exact same structure as the previous corn export graphs. So uh, first in the left graph, the shipped or committed soybean export volume is placed much lower than last year. Uh, although the, this year's export is almost the same as the five-year average export, which means at least not bad, but it is certainly a bit disappointing compared with, uh, with the last year's surprising amount of export. Um, the right graph shows country-wise export shifts, and we can see the reduction in export to China was the main reason for the export drop. Um, so I'd say we need to keep an eye on the export flow to get a better picture of soybean demand during this market year. Um, next, uh, let me talk about a hot topic, um, fertilizer prices. Um, the graph is showing the weekly price trend of fertilizer uh, prices expressed by the index relative to 2011. So um, 2011 is set as 100 and other years prices are adjusted by the, re uh, by the reference year. Uh, with that, we can make a more precise year-to-year -year comparison because of the index is uh, inflation adjusted. Uh, for example, this year fertilizer uh, prices are about 91, which means it is not as uh, expensive as 2011, but it is uh, the highest in the last five year period. Um, there are four reasons explaining the current skyrocketing fertilizer prices. Uh, one, uh, general supply chain issue with pandemic. And two, Hurricane Ida had caused substantial damage to many uh, anhydrous ammonia plants in Louisiana, ex exacerbating the supply issue. And third, um, high natural gas prices. And uh, four is just overall inflation. Um, of course, it is a bit restrictive to discuss uh, price changes or inflation since the left graph is representing the inflation adjusted index, not price itself. So, uh, so it doesn't uh, explicitly report the price scale. Uh, so in the next slide, I will show you the nominal prices for fertilizers. Uh, so um, the graph shows the nominal price trends of four major fertilizer groups. Um, the line graphs, stand for the price level, um, which is denoted by the left y-axis. And the bar graph in the below, uh, it illustrates the percentage change from last October denoted by the right y-axis. Uh, when looking at October, uh, October 29 this year, all, all fertilizer prices are found to increase from 80% to 132% from a year ago. The nitrogen price lines um, like urea uh, colored by gray and ammonia uh, colored by red 
uh, have rapidly climbed during October, actually, like this one and this one. Uh, the two have increased more than 100% from last year. Obviously, this uh, must be big pressure on the farmers' cost management. So I'd recommend the farmers to consult with uh, agronomists, uh, regional extension officers, or trusted advisors in order to learn more about the maximum return to fertilizer use for their own farmland. And also like the, um, there is some like extension uh, tool available uh, from, I think this is multinational like extension like uh, project uh, to, to, to provide uh, some like calculation of the maximum return of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. So this link can be another useful source. Um, and here is another information about uh, the, the cost management for this uh, skyrocketing fertilizer prices. Um, this is table uh, borrowed from FarmDoc Daily, which is generated from a survey on uh, Illinois farmers. Uh, so the underlying parameters should be a bit different from Ohio farmers. Uh, with a grain of salt, I would like to make a few comparisons between corn versus soybean in terms of the cost estimates. Um, the, the, when planting corn, the total fertilizer cost estimate uh, gets bigger by um, $99 per acre uh, compared to last year. On the other hand, if soybean is planted, the table says the fertilizer cost will be increased by uh, $51 per acre. Um, so when we just like compare uh, so corn to soybean, um, this is this almost double increase in fertilizer cost is attributable to ammonia cost, the, the red, colored by red here, uh, nit a nitrogen fertilizer. Of course, uh, the given numbers are crude estimate that do not account for individual farmland conditions. And also we are not thinking about the, the price or relative revenue between these two different crops, but uh, the bottom line, uh, tells the importance of the cost comparison and input management. Uh, therefore, again, I suggest farmers pay extra attention to cost man management this year. And um, maybe like one, one may wonder if the nitrogen fertilizer price issue can be resolved shortly. Uh, and at this point, uh, in my opinion, I'm pessimistic about it. Um, natural gas takes about uh, 70 to 90 percent of ammonia production cost. So uh, nitrogen fertilizer price tends to be the lag of natural gas price and as shown in the graph, uh, it is keep increasing. Uh, elaborating on the graph, um, Henley, Her Henley Hub weekly spot price data was used. The left uh, red dot uh, with 2.05 indicates the natural gas price before the pandemic. And the, mid, mid, the middle red dot with uh, 12.18 indicates the exceptional high price due to the winter storm in Texas last February. And the right dot uh, is uh, price at the end of October, which is uh, $5.68 per uh, BTU, a British, British uh, thermal unit. Uh, this is well over the five year average of natural gas prices by uh, by 98% higher. So considering the natural gas as, as a kind of uh, prevision for fertilizer prices, it is unlikely to see the fertilizer prices going back to the usual level. Um, and let me quickly go through the uh, glo uh, global weather conditions uh, with a focus on uh, major corn soybean producing countries. Um, the, the picture uh, is from the from this week's uh, USDA weekly weather and crop bulletin. Uh, first, uh, central and northern east, central and northeastern uh, Brazil is having widespread rainfall, which keeps soybean and other emerging uh, summer crops under favorable conditions. So maybe I would uh, give a, a green light. Um, and uh, over 99% of soybeans are reported to be planted as of this week uh, in Brazil, in this area. Uh, in contrast, uh, 
Southern Brazil keeps having continuous dry condition. Um, so I give the red light for that. And uh, Argentina had beneficial uh, rain after dryness in the Western uh, farming area. So uh, overall its planting progress is on par with last year. So this is pretty, I think, uh, green light situation. And in the case of China, uh, cold weather uh, hit the wheat and uh, rapeseed farming area uh, delaying crop development. So um, it is a red light situation. Uh, also major crop uh, producers in Black Sea region, uh, Russia and Ukraine had good weather conditions. Um, dry weather in Ukraine helped, uh, sp helped speed up a summer crop harvest and uh, showers in Russia supplied uh, proper, proper moisture for winter wheat. So I, I gave a green light to them and um, so, yeah, I have other things to discuss, but yeah, let's jump into the next slide. Um, so this is uh, world uh, corn production. Um, this table gives some estimates of the, uh, the, the export competing countries corn supply, as well as uh, the entire global corn supply. Uh, first, worldwide, Corn production is predicted to increase by 80.85.6 uh, million tons, uh, uh, which is about 7.6 percent uh, from from last year. 7.6 percent up from last year, um, and I marked the top three uh, top three corn producing countries: the U.S., Brazil, and China. And the three countries are actually accounting for uh, sixty-four percent of total global corn production. Interestingly, it turns out that about eighty percent of the increase in global corn supply next year is estimated uh, to be coming from the top three countries. Um, and this is world soybean production. Um, this is a similar table uh, for uh, like so, like like the case of corn. The world uh, soybean production is projected to be increased by 17.8 million tons, about 4.9% uh, up from last year. And the top three soybean producing countries are the United States, Brazil, and Argentina. The three countries are producing, uh, uh, pro producing, um, I think, give me a second, um, I think, uh, pro this, uh, this is typo. I think uh, this is not 64%. This is producing about 82% uh, of global uh, soybean production based on the given prediction. So sorry for the typo. This is not 64, this is 82. Besides, uh, 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 48, uh, so yeah, this is, yeah, those are typos, sorry. Um, this besides 48, 84% uh, of, of increased global uh, production is estimated to be captured by the top three uh, countries. Uh, from the global uh, production predictions, we can see that the grain markets are getting more and more concentrated, uh, implying, implying the bigger importance of understanding the competing countries' agriculture. Um, now let's, uh, let's move on to the livestock outlook. Um, uh, this is really a, a brief overview. So uh, what I want to hear is just to make a few punch lines. Uh, first, uh, beef and pork production are uh, predicted to slightly decrease next year, um, but uh, they are not uh, likely to make a big difference on the supply side. Uh, the thing that I want to highlight is, is the prices. Uh, while beef price is increasing, uh, uh, $8.69 per um, CW2. Um, pork price is decreasing more than a $7. Uh, I would find a reason for the, the, con the contrasting price changes from export volumes. Um, uh, these are the same types of graphs that uh, you have seen in the corn and uh, soybeans, uh, the only difference is the market year uh, is starting from January uh, in this case. As you can see uh, in the left graph, the beef export has been well above the five-year average 
as well as uh, to, uh, as well as the 2020 trajectory. Uh, uh, specifically, when looking at the top six uh, beef importing countries, we can see that a remarkable increase in export sales towards China, uh, over 200 percent. Um, I would pick the strong global demand as a main reason for the beef price increase. And here is the pork export trend. Uh, the red line for uh, 2021 is still above five-year average level, but it looks uh, departing from the last year's uh, trend. Uh, when looking at the right graph, we easily identify the reduction in export toward China was the number one reason. Um, this change is a consequence of the Chinese uh, re recovery from uh, African swine fever. Uh, considering more than 25% of US pork production is uh, used for export, this shift may have unsurprisingly drawn down the pork price. And uh, here is the last slide uh, for a quick wrap up. Um, we have looked through uh, four major commodity markets here. Um, overall, uh, both corn and uh, soybean are reported to have a positive, as a positive prospects in terms of production and price in uh, livestock, um, beef price is predicted to be higher than last year, contrary to the dropping pork price. Uh, I also listed a few, a few key variables that uh, would be important for these commodities uh, during this market year. Um, first, uh, the common key variables are uh, pandemic and supply chain issues, uh, export, and energy cost, uh, those are, I think, commonly really uh, making some uh, fundamental issues to all the commodity markets. So uh, we have to, of course, like uh, keep paying attention to them. And um, speaking of the commodity uh, specific key variables, uh, first, uh, higher Input cost would be the key challenge to corn and soybean producers, uh, like you know, chemicals, fertilizers, seeds. Those are all kind of um, uh, like continuously increasing. So, so this cost uh, needs to be, I think, well managed uh, for the successful farming. And to the livestock sector, the capacity constraint of meat processing would be a continuous challenge uh, combined with labor issue. Um, so what I heard from uh, my colleague was, this is uh, kind of uh, like when, when it comes to the sl slaughter facility, it is like not a lack of animal, but a lack of people or worker uh, to run the uh, meat processing factory. So, so that is, I think, of course, again, we are like get back to the issue of the pandemic and labor shortage, which was covered by uh, Dr. Margaret Jodlowski uh, yesterday. And, and third, um, I wanna pick a renewable buyer for uh, RVO, renewable volume obligation and extra uh, and, uh, and nitrogen, extra nitrogen cost will be another uh, challenge to corn producers here. Um, so, which was already covered, uh, which can potentially make, uh, which, which can potentially harm the profitability of uh, corn production, maybe RVO may affect the corn price reduction and nitrogen fertilizer, of course, affect the cost aspects of corn production. So this is another um, key variable. And fourth, um, the soybean, beef, pork commonly had more than 30% change in Chinese export from last year, uh, which is unambiguously affected their commodity market. So, so keeping an eye on the Chinese import com commitment should be useful uh, information uh, to, to read the market situation for these three commodities. Um, okay, um, I think that's the end of my presentation. And I think um, it's a good time to, yeah, let me stop sharing my screen and
Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Sunki, for that. That really, um, you, you covered a lot of ground there, and I know uh, looking in the appendix, uh, you have uh, some discussion of wheat, and maybe uh, when we come to questions, uh, we may actually ask you, put you on the spot on, 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 the, on the wheat market. But I see we have a couple of questions uh, already in the, the chat room. Um, uh, these are both from my colleague, Brent Sonjan. Uh, mm -hmm. So Brent's first question, and this relates to, to ethanol. So his question says, given that ethanol consumption follows gasoline prices, do you expect gasoline prices to remain high and thus ethanol consumption to remain high through 2021? Um, that, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I, I think um, two days ago, like, like this Wednesday, actually, uh, I think um, President Biden asked uh, the FTC to, uh, to examine the, the big oil companies with some suspect, suspicion of the, 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 the price, like uh, strategic pricing uh, in, in the industry side. So I don't think that is like making any like economic implications, but uh, I believe this is kind of a signal that like government is uh, trying to track the gasoline prices and at least uh, trying to like trying to contain it at, at certain rate range of uh, prices so that it, it can it, it cannot be a factor to make a, a, a make a high inflation uh, situation. So in that sense, maybe I don't think gasoline price will not be, as uh, super increasing as like this year, but of course I don't think it can be easily uh, it can be easily uh, going down as well. So maybe like more or less the current situation with some fluctuation will go on, so that the high ethanol pr price and high gasoline price will be like will be uh, maintained uh, from now on. I think. Yeah, I think that. Um... You know the administration is paying a lot of attention to antitrust issues and it's not just yes. in the gasoline industry i i've seen a number of articles um, about revisiting the whole issue of you know market power being exploited in the meat packing industry and there's generally i think there's a we might be witnessing a, a change in the way we think about antitrust issues here uh, both from a policy perspective and a legal perspective so and by the way brent meant to say uh, remaining high through 2022. He just texted me to say that he, that he, he meant 2022. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, he has another question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll segue into that in, in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you an obvious question um, about fertilizer prices. And you, 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 know, you reported the data from Illinois and, and farm doc. And I think that was probably uh, my former colleague, Gary Schnitke, uh, wrote that report. And I want to put you on the spot. Gary predicted that even with these higher fertilizer prices, he didn't think farmers were going to shift that much into soybeans, uh, given the, the lower fertilizer costs. So do you think he's right? Or and do you, what do you think is going to happen in Ohio? Maybe that's a tough uh, question, but I, I, I'm interested <laughs> to know what your thoughts are. Uh, I, I, I think I, I think I, I like almost agree with his point. But, uh, I actually had kind of I, I picked up uh, two relevant information from one is from USDA, uh, which is saying the soybean acreage will be like, increasing like with some high pr probability, but will not be as much as like as as much dramatic as because of this high fertilizer price so that's the first reason and second um i think that is another like maybe like uh gary Schnick, he, he has some like i think uh, rationale making that argument uh, one of i think the report uh, from the from the daily was showing the 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 net profit of like relative profit between corn and soybean and recent two years actually corn was slightly more profitable than soybean so in that sense maybe farmers are still kind of more inclined to planting corn based on the experiences that they have gone through so in that sense maybe based on farmers experience and they also know much better than than any others about their own farmland so based on that they will make the decisions so that 
it is not just simply the kind of function of the fertilizer price and the acreage of soybean. So right. in that sense, I think I agree with his point. So actually we have a follow-up question from Sam Custer. Um, mm -hmm. He says, welcome to Ohio State and the state of Ohio. And thanks for your presentation today. But his question is kind of, a, it's linked to what we were just talking about. Do you believe the commodity prices will track fertilizer prices? Um, well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a tough question. Um, well, well, given every, every condition, like it, this is kind of some economic jargon, like ceteris paribus, everything is same, then this, of course, this is a factor like uh, making the, the commodity price also higher because of this higher input cost. But we are also facing like a lot of competition in the global market. And if other competitors are providing a good amount of soybean and corn, uh, even with this like pressure with fertilizers, then fertilizer cost, then of course the commodity price cannot sustain with like, and cannot go along with this uh, high fertilizer cost. So yeah, that's my opinion. What's your, I guess, just following up on that point, um, the increase in fertilizer prices is not unique to the United States, correct? So in Europe, yes. a lot of this is driven by Russian policy towards natural gas exports to to Western Europe. So my guess is, yeah, we might see some correlation between commodity price, but it's going to be, I think it's probably going to be global, not just necessarily unique, unique to the United States. So I have a question here from my former colleague, Alan Lines. Uh, Alan, of course, asked me a question yesterday. He always has good questions. He says, if I saw your graphs correctly, help me understand why US exports to Japan are down so much for this marketing year. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's that's a good question. I was also confused. That that is I, like this. This is really like just my opinion. So you should take it with a grain of salt. But uh, I would I would say maybe first maybe Japan Japan's like domestic situation was the the, the reason. Uh, maybe they they have uh, some like enough supply so that they don't need to import that much amount of uh, crop. And second maybe just timing um, because of the shipment issue or others, uh, Japan could have imported more amount of uh, corn or soybean, but because of this shipping issues, they just maybe uh, usually like detoured through the multinational companies, but it is, we also could see a larger amount of unknown like uh, reduction in, in exports as well. So this kind of uh, general shipment issue is making also make uh, Japan to uh, to lessen the amount of import. That's kind of my gut feeling as well. But of course, that that is still like, uh, I'm trying to identify the exact reason, but I, I couldn't find it correctly. Yeah, it's kind of surprising given that the United States has signed a bilateral trade agreement with Japan, which focused very much on, you know, opening up market access for the US to Japan, uh, which we didn't get because we didn't join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But thinking back to the slides I had up yesterday, if you go back and look at the, the transport cost, the bulk grain shipments to Japan, they've doubled both out of the Gulf and out of the Pacific Northwest. So I think, yeah, I think what's driving this is probably transport costs and they can presumably import from you know, Australia or um, elsewhere in, in Asia, so my guess is it's it's largely price driven, uh, not some structural shift away <laughs> in Japan from American food imports. Um, I think okay, so we, too, I'm, yeah. I'm going to go back to Brent's other question. This takes us back to natural gas prices. Mm -hmm. um, so he says higher natural gas prices should typically cause more production in natural gas price producing regions. Yet output in the Utica shale region in, in Ohio has remained fairly stable over the last 20 months. So production doesn't seem to be keeping up with demand. Should we expect these higher natural gas prices to persist through to spring next year? Um, well, that's, uh, yeah, I like, it's, um, 
so many so many things are really like moving together so like it, but the, like simply speaking i i would say i think so um it, of course i don't think it will be keep rising but uh it will like keep like maintaining in in the in this like relatively high level of price um because i think this is like we are still like suffering from this supply bottleneck and one of the bottlenecks is of course the energy and natural gas is of course still have a strong demand and this i think this trend will continue at, at least like until next spring so in that sense um price is likely to be maintained in this kind of high level but but i'm not sure it will like keep rising like as we have seen for the last few months so so in that sense like it is a bit cautious about to, to predict the precise level about it so yesterday I had a question. I wasn't really sure how to answer. I think I could answer it better now having looked at your discussion and the questions. But um, I think it was a former student of mine, Clint, asked yesterday, was, was there any trade policy choices that could be made that would affect fertilizer prices? And my hunch was no, but I guess a more broad question, are there any policy levers available to the administration to help mitigate these fertilizer price increases or, or is that just something we have to leave to the markets um so actually i i read one news um that is more i think kind of a, a stakeholder oriented um news but um their their argument was we have to open up the the, the free trade to monaco because like monaco is actually kind of can, can, can i think they have some feasible amount of uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which can be quickly supplied to you know, United States. So, so like they really like kind of trying to, trying to push the government to make the quick decision to to open up the door and get the fertilizer quickly because they are really facing the fertilizer application season. Uh, I think that was what was discussed like last month or this month. So it's it's really kind of the new new issue and recently discussed. So in that sense, maybe. It seems there are a few spots that like kind of make the governments get, can bump up the increase of uh, fertilizer supply uh, to the market, but I'm not sure whether that is really a possible option because you know that takes some time and maybe during that time already farmers will lose the timing. So in this sense, even though like governments is, is try, really trying to quickly move on and make that decision, but I don't think that will really come to the market and the delay will will really screw up the farming process like maybe that can be helpful for the spring fertilizer application but not this winter season okay um we have a few minutes left i i don't see any more questions in the question and answer box so i i encourage anybody in the audience who who has a question they maybe like to ask but i i wanted to maybe push you a little bit on um, what you didn't talk about but, and that's a bit unfair but it's in your slide your appendix um, okay. <laughs> so you know what i'm tracking right now is you know global food security issues and you know as i mentioned yesterday the united nations is particularly concerned about what's happening to wheat prices and uh, global wheat prices and given how important wheat is in uh, low income consumers diets in developing countries many developing countries so i but i look at you know i look at your the data you have i think it's in the last table in your appendix uh, mm -hmm. so us stocks are going down us exports are declining so what's your gut feeling about about the us the us market's reaction to what's going on in the global market for wheat any any feeling any sense about that <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think um, it's, it seems really uh, the well based on what what I have seen is the, the, the it is just more or less like the U.S. Su supply is kind of going through the the market flow, uh, which is not like typically having a, a specific like intention to make some like up impact to to the global like supply or market of course like the goodwill is of course like trying to distribute distribute more more like uh, amount of production to uh global market but um 
Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm like at this moment, it's probably just market mechanism would be the best way to understand and interpret the behavior of uh, U.S. supply to the global market. But it does. I mean, I alerted people to the fact that yesterday, you know, I alerted mm -hmm. people yesterday to the fact that um, we're seeing wheat stocks being run down. And yes. From sort of a broader food security issue that that seems I mean, it's not an Ohio problem, but it's a it's a global problem. I mean, would you tell farmers maybe to think about planting more wheat or uh, is that is, should I not push you in that direction? <laughs> Um, well, it's really up to the, the U.S. farmers this season, uh, and it seems at, at least at this moment, uh, U.S. farmers are judging uh, corn and soybean is, are, are more profitable. Uh, so uh, it seems they don't see wheat are very competitive alternative compared to corn and soybean. So, uh, so I don't believe farmers will like move from move to satisfy the, the global needs of wheat uh, uh, in, in the short run. Of course, in the, in the longer term, we can get some consensus and well, well, the government or like UN can incentivize more farmers to plant wheat for the, for the uh, food production. But um, so far, like up to this point, I, I don't think that that is the case. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, we, we, uh, Siunki was very efficient on his time and left plenty of time for questions. So I think we've covered all the questions that people have. Um, just so that people know, um, the slides will be available uh, if people would like to, to, to use them. And uh, you can follow up with Siunki. I'm sure many of you have questions that you'll think about over the next couple of weeks as we, we pay attention to what's happening in markets as the US harvest comes to an end and we, we go moving into the latter stages of the, of the marketing year uh, into January, February, March. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this session. I think it's been very, very thorough coverage and I wanna thank Siung Ki for doing a fantastic job in his first major presentation in, uh, to, to stakeholders here in Ohio and, 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 and to others. So. Thanks so much, Yung Ki, for that great presentation. Thanks everybody for attending.